Washtenaw County occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabek of the Three Fires Confederacy, the Odawa, Ojibwe, and Badawatomi. The Washtenaw County Democratic Party recognizes historic indigenous communities in Michigan and those who were forcibly removed from their homelands. Washtenaw County occupies the land ceded in the 1807 Treaty of Detroit. We further recognize the ongoing, this always, this always kind of breaks me up. We further recognize the ongoing relationship of dependence upon and respect for all living beings of earth, sky, and water. See, I told you. In offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty, history, and experiences. Thank you to, I believe, our member, Andrea Pierce, who's chair of the Anishinaabe Caucus at the MDP, who I think wrote that, at least was the lead writer on that. Okay, I have a few quick things from the party itself. Um, first of all, if you're new, if this is your first meeting with the, MW, the WCDP, would you kindly stand up and wave? We really are, come on, come on. I'm looking at you. <laughs> okay, great. It is, yes, thank you, Helene, welcome. We are so, so happy to have you here. We're really thrilled. And walking back that way, Sharon, Sharon, <laughs> why don't you come up here real quick? And Sharon is the co-chair of our membership committee and is the volunteer coordinator. And she does an unbelievable job. She's the best volunteer coordinator we have ever had. <laughs> In fact, the only formal one, but also I'm sure her legacy will stand for a long time. Do you want to say anything about our needs and... We have volunteer roles all the way from, you know, an hour a month to, you know, committee membership and anything you love to do or want to do to support us this year, we'd love to have you. And it can include, you know, helping out in November with delivering voter guides to being involved with the committee for education, outreach, um, any activities. So please send me an email. We need people who crunch data, who program, who maintain databases, whatever it is. Send me an email or talk to me after the meeting. Look forward to meeting you. Thanks. One of the one of the things that one of the areas where we're going to need help and we always need help every year, besides delivery of the voter guide, is uh, is creation of the voter guide. It has is there anybody that hasn't seen the voter guide? Okay, so the it was started by actually our friend Jennifer Fairfield over in who was chair of Western Washington Dems for a long time, and now. This year, we made Western Washington Dems a voting caucus of the WCDP, which is really exciting to have everybody in the same place now that we have we share a congressional district. Um, it is it is one of the most powerful tools any county party has. It lists our um, our endorsements, our county party endorsements. Um, and of course, you know, it's easy to do the partisan endorsements. We know who we're going to, you know, you know, straight ticket. OK. But the nonpartisan endorsements that some of the school boards, especially out there, some of the, um, you know, township boards and so forth. And, of course, judicial races are nonpartisan. And I know I have, as a voter in decades past, have left places blank because I don't know who to vote for. So this voter guide um, collects everything and gives your gives information about who we support the Washington County Democratic Party for these nonpartisan positions. Super, super important and a lot of work. And something I want to actually tell you about, bookmark this on your phones, myvoter.org, mivoter.org. Um, our precinct organizing committee, uh, it besides organizing volunteers to get this created and out, has been working with um, an amazing team of technical experts to create a, an online, a digital version that's best actually on your phone. So right now it's mivoter.org. Right now it's in, it's, it's in development still, but for 2024, of course, we don't have our endorsements yet, but um, you can, anybody, if you have a college student or, a, or, or, you know, a young person who needs to know, like, but is afraid to ask, who's my representative? You know, I don't know who it is. All of that information is already there. Who, just with your address, put in your address and find out who your representative is. Boom. And if everybody who represents you at that address comes up, it is so 
fantastic. And I am super excited to tell you that the MDP, the Michigan Democratic Party, has elected to adopt our <laughs> electronic voter guide for its use statewide next year. So this is a huge, huge win. And I, I'm going to, well, I won't, if I say Ed's name, he'll be mad. <laughs> but um, Ed Saunders is our co-chair of Precinct Organizing and has, has led a team that's developed this. And it is really exciting. So, and then, so part of that, the reason I started talking about the voter guide is because we, um, it's a lot of work to put it together. So we, it's a huge team of writers and editors, and we need to get, collect the statements from everybody. Ours, we don't just scrape the internet. We, you know, we collect statements from candidates and we have a process through which we decide which of these nonpartisan candidates we're going to endorse. It's a lot of work. So that's another thing. And when Sharon says write to me, um, the way to do that is at volunteer at washingtonodems.org. All right. Volunteer at washingtonodems.org. Sharon has a full plate, <laughs> shall we say, not only um, handling incoming volunteers, but also, and actually, if you want to help with volunteers, that would also be very welcome. Um, but also we, Sharon and I and others in the party have started Young Dems Washtenaw this past year. We're meeting with Young Dems, the Young Dems core organizing team tomorrow for the first time this year. And we're super excited about that, that group um, because, you know, tomorrow belongs to them, right? All right. So um, I have so much that I could say, but right now I'm going to turn it over to any uh, any uh, committee chairs who want to speak. Before I do that, I want you to know that there's three things out on the table, at least, that you can take, and I encourage you to take. One is this beautiful poster created by one of our volunteers, Lisa Murphy, uh, which we used back in October for, a, for our kind of 2024 kickoff. And it's gorgeous together. We've got this, Dems everywhere. But then on the back is really, really, or is QR codes to really important information about how to vote, you know, where to vote and so forth. The Secretary of State's office. This information also lives on myvoter.org. All right. And then also out there is a beautiful button, Dems Everywhere 2024. And thanks to Kathy Wyatt, who's here somewhere and is the chair of this, one of the chairs of this, or, this um, meeting, we stand against hate. That's all anybody needs to know about us, right? Not all, but it's pretty important. So please feel free to take any of those things. It's free with our blessing. Okay. Are there any other um, committee co-chairs who have anything they want to say or electeds? What's the year look like coming up? <laughs> oh God, Jason says. Yeah. So Justin and I were thinking, Justin Hodges, the yeah. Hey, good morning, everybody. Ooh, that's loud. Jason, do you want the mic to talk about what's going on in Lansing? You can give a quick, yeah, just come into the frame over here. You want to get you in the shot. Yeah, get in the shot. And uh, our congresswoman uh, will be calling in um, at, about, at about 10. So, uh, Hi, folks. For some of the new folks, I'm Jason Morgan. I'm one of our state representatives in Washtenaw County. Uh, and you may have... Uh, Heard a lot of things about the state legislature this year. Uh, we won our first majority in the first for the first time in 40 years. Uh, Katie's very Katie. great. Uh, well, and then in November, we had a couple members of the House of Representatives run for mayor of their local towns. Uh, and so we are now at an even split in the House of Representatives, 54-54. Uh, what that means uh, is that we... Uh, still technically sort of have a majority in terms of when the rules were set, uh, the rules set that we don't make any changes to who's in charge or committees or anything unless there's a 55-55 split, um, because that would be a, a real formal majority. It's very clear these two seats are Democratic seats, and so the, the argument or the logic at that time was that these seats will be filled in these special elections. One is in, the primary is in... Um, uh, February, the end of February, uh, and the general election is in April. Uh, but, but but from now until basically early May, uh, we will only be able to pass things that have bipartisan support. Uh, I don't. It looked like we did a lot this last year, and we did do a heck of a lot this year. But let me tell you, 
even getting all of the Democrats on board uh, with every single vote was sometimes challenging. So to get things through with every Democrat plus a Republican or two uh, is going to be especially challenging, um, but very possible. I think all of us are very committed to saying there are a ton of issues that we deal with that shouldn't really be partisan issues. Uh, and so it really is more the fringe kind of right wing that uh, makes them partisan issues. But for the most part, a lot of the stuff that we do absolutely can be bipartisan. It'll just be a question of whether the Republicans are willing to work with us and kind of common sense, easy things, or if they just say no to emphasize that we wouldn't be able to get something done. With that said, committees are still happening. The Senate still is majority. The governor is still working really hard. So we still have a lot of legislative work that can still move forward. And a lot of the legislative and budget process happens long before an actual like final vote of the legislature. So a ton of stuff is still going to be moving. A couple big issues I want to highlight for folks here, because I know this is really important to us, uh, polluter pay legislation. This is something that absolutely can't pass until we have those seats filled, probably, but uh, that is going to be a huge effort. Democrats have said for many, many years that we'd like to restore polluter pay legislation in Michigan uh, to make sure that those who pollute our environment are responsible for paying to clean it up. Uh, the big question will be, can we get that through this year? Senator Irwin has worked on this for a long time. He and I have been working on this uh, over the last year. We have a phenomenal bill package put together that would require polluters to pay for their messes uh, and ensure some uh, prevention of, of future messes, at least by ensuring accountability going forward. Uh, so we're going to need a lot of help advocating for that over the next few months to get that through. Uh, that'll be huge. The other big pu push I'm making is on public transportation throughout Michigan. Uh, that is going to be my like huge, huge effort this year because I think, is, frankly, with Democrats in charge, if we can't make a real significant investment in public transportation now, that we'll never be able to. The majority of the legislature uh, is from areas of high public transit, um, areas where that would be really useful. So we just have to build the support for something like that. But anyway, so that's what's coming this year. There's going to be a whole lot on our plate. Uh, the big shift is going to be towards elections, but a lot of us still want to get policy done too. So uh, stick with us. <laughs> Thanks, Jason. And for all of you who wondered, who's my state rep? Or who's my county commissioner again? Uh, and Justin Hodge, <laughs> who's the vice chair of the party, is also the chair of the county board of commissioners, just so you know. Um, but I was going to let me finish that first thought. If you don't know who your rep is, do not be embarrassed. You don't have to tell anybody. Go to myvoter.org and find out. And myvoter.org. And it's all there down to your precinct delegates, which is pretty darn impressive. So um, real quick, I want to. Because we have Debbie on the, you know what? Let's hold a Congresswoman Dingle. Debbie. Thank you. Thanks, Teresa. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm sorry I'm not there, but I am in Washington, D.C., reminding people what happened and the threat to our democracy on January 6th. So, um, uh, and I want to say that to all of you. Today is January 6th, and I encourage you to use this as an opportunity to remind people what Donald Trump wants to do to our country, that he tried to disrupt the constitutional pro pro process. He encouraged people to come to the Capitol who came armed. People died that day. More than 700 people have been convicted. And this is a time to remind people that we live in the greatest country in the world, but we can never take anything for granted. So I don't mean to be sober as we're starting this new year, but it is January 6th as you're having this first meeting. And it's something that we really need to understand and remember that our democracy is fragile. And that I think the most likely candidate going into this presidential election year uh, on the Republican side is gonna be Donald Trump. And I'm gonna tell every last one of you, I'm going to make it my mission to stand up to his bullying defining who he is and letting people on helping people understand what is at stake. So I'll start there. Um, I hope everybody had a good holiday. It's great to be in 2024, but this is going to be a very full challenging year. Um, 
It is presidential election, the Michigan presidential primary. We worked more than 30 years to have Michigan as a key player uh, in uh, the primary process to see candidates come here. What you're going to just watch this dynamic. You're going to you're starting to see it now. Uh, New Hampshire does not have an official Democratic primary. The Republicans are in New Hampshire. Uh, we got Iowa. Then you have Nevada, South Carolina, and then Michigan at the end of the month before Super Tuesday. Uh, we're, we're, uh, the Biden people have appointed a state director, Eddie Duggan. Uh, we're working with them on, we're going to get lots of people in here and we've got to energize people to be engaged. But as we go back, as Jason said, it's a political year and it's a policy year. Uh, this month is going to be, I'm going to try to be home a lot, but I'll be home next weekend and it's Martin Luther King's birthday and it'll be a time many of us will gather and remember the fights of previous uh, generations. But uh, the budget, the first part of the budget, remember Michael Johnson wanted to do a stepped process. So half of the government agencies' budgets expire on Friday, January 19th. The second half expire February 2nd. And it's not clear what's going to happen. Uh, the, and we also need supplemental funding. We need it for Ukraine. We need humanitarian aid for Gaza. Uh, we've got to look at Israel and the Republicans are saying that we need to do something about the border. And quite frankly, I think we make a mistake when we don't say that we've got to deal with the border, but we need to talk about it in human ways. And remember that there are people that are escaping drastic situations. Uh, we also have people we need, we have a shortage in small businesses and farmers and caregiving. So we need people to help fill some of the open jobs that we have. On the other hand, fentanyl is coming over the border. We have a national security issue. We need to sit at the table and talk about all the issues. These are hard issues. And it hasn't been done for decades through Republican presidents and Democratic presidents. I think the crisis we see right now should be the catalyst for us trying to get something done. Um, big cities are hurting as we're doing all of this. It's complicated. It's hard. But that's what we're elected to do is to address hard, complicated issues. So the border is going to be one of the fronts and centers. Uh, the other thing I want to say to you is that I think Washtenaw Dems are in a unique position to try to bring a, a, human, a human perspective to what is happening in the Mideast. We have a significant Jewish community in Washington. They are very much feeling uh, that, that anti-Semitism is being targeted at them. I'm sorry, some people may disagree with me. What Hamas did was a terrorist attack. And I will never back down because I have spent more time. I have and seen footage and talked to people on the horrors of rape that day that will never leave my mind or my soul. So telling me that it's made up doesn't work and I've had some of that. But I also wanna to say to you, we have a very significant Palestinian Muslim community and they are, Gaza is, I mean, Israel has got to understand what they've done to Gaza. The president does. 85% of the people don't have homes to go back to. They're living in shelters or on the street. I mean, there's like one toilet for every 220 people, one shower for 4,500 people. There's no medicine, there's no food, there's no water. I have been involved in casework where I've got, I mean, in their families, there's a doctor at the University of Michigan whose family is over there, they have no water. I'm just screaming at the White House. I'm screaming at State Department. It's not clear who's in charge on the ground. We care about people on all sides. And we got to figure out a way that we're bringing it to, you know, I've called for the ceasefire. I've called for it multiple times. So nobody, um, and I've but made it clear, communicated with the Jewish community. I talk to them regularly. I talk to everybody. And our kids are afraid on campus. 
we this and I I'm going to say something. I don't care if I get quoted. I believe Russia and mega people are taking this very difficult moment and trying to pit us and divide us against each other more, putting kerosene on a difficult situation. And I think the thoughtful leaders in this room and in this party that need to try to help bring people together. And if there's anything good that's going to come out of this, and I don't know that there's anything good, maybe once and for all, we get a two-state solution because Palestinians deserve to have their own state. So I could go on. It's not going to be a quiet year. I'm not going to lie to you guys. I'm going to work close with Teresa and uh, everybody else to make sure you know the events that are going to be coming up. We'll start getting cabinet officers. We're going to have to, but I got a lot of work. I got to roll up my sleeves. There's a lot of issues that I care about. I'm working with EPA on for Washington, the PFAS and other issues like that. Doing uh, And one of the things that I'm concerned about is that I've always been accessible and state reps and I have always done many town halls to talk about issues and we got to figure out how we're still accessible without events being disrupted. So people who have real issues that want to be heard and, and want to talk about them can do it. Uh, but, you know, the rest of health care, we've got to do still do a lot more on that. We've made progress, diabetes, insulin's down, but there's still a drug cost um, problem. Home care, we've got a, we got a crisis in caregiving from child care to senior care to disability care, I could go through the list. And I'm not going to, I'm even going to warn you all, I'm taking on image and likeness for sports. I think we're all a go blue mood on Monday night. And I tell all my colleagues in the caucus, who can't say go blue in the Democratic caucus as a theme um, for this year? So it's going to be a very serious year, year, my friends. And I do believe the future of democracy at stake so Teresa thank you, thank you for you all you do my god you do so much work um do we have we we might have time for one question for congresswoman dingle anybody have anything real quick yeah caroline um i think it thank you caroline it thank you for with, uh so many of us and we just thank her for speaking out on this issue. Caroline, okay. would you say that again? Because you didn't have the mic. Oh, first I just spoke. want to thank Congresswoman Dingell for that op-ed in the New York Times. It was wonderful. And someone had to say it. And thank you for putting yourself out there and um, kind of having to bear all of the intimidation directed your way, but speaking out for so, so many of us, probably the majority of us. Yeah. Yes, Thanks, thank Caroline. You. Thank you. And it means will, a lot. Yeah. And we'll I'm probably going to need you guys because they're going to come after me. He does we, not like me. I don't know what I did to get under his skin, but I'm not going to be bullied. We have to stand up to bullies and those that are spreading hate and division. Yeah. We're a cordon of support. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you so much for everything you're doing. We only have a couple minutes, and I know Helene Silverberg, oop, where are you? There you are. Uh, from, why don't you come on up? <clears throat> but before she comes up, I want all of the electeds in the room, please stand up. Stand up, stand up, stand up. Thanks, thanks, thanks. All right, great. Wave. I just want everybody to know. Yes, thank you. Thank you for all your work. You want to introduce yourself real quick? I already introduced Justin. Go ahead. Oh, introduce myself again? Hey, I'm Justin Hodge. I'm the chair of the Washtenaw County Board of Commissioners. I'll walk around with the mic quickly. Uh, thank you, Justin. I'm Ellie Savitt. I'm the county prosecutor. All right. I'm Annie Somerville, Washtenaw County Commissioner for Ypsilanti. One of them. Well, I'm, I'm the other one. Yeah, thank you. Uh, delegate, Janet Cannon. I see the other guys didn't stand up, but don't forget us. <laughs> I also am a precinct delegate. So is Michael. So is, so is um, my friend Dirk. Yeah. Thank you. Jeff Gaynor, Ann Arbor School Board. Jason Morgan, State Representative, District 23. How are we doing, everyone? Ernesto Carriero, Ann Arbor School Board. Great. Anybody else? All right. Thank you. Everybody who's here who's not an elected, <laughs> um, recognize that this is where you can go. Oh, I'm sorry. James Daniel, precinct delegate, Ward 1. Great. Thank you, James. 
long time precinct delegate. So is Michael Cohen. So is Dirk Mayhew. So just um, understand that this is where you can come one place, one stop shopping every month to talk to electeds, to talk to people who might elect you. You have questions about what they're doing. You have questions about you have worried about this and that. Who's not? We're so worried this year. It's really going to be scary. It is scary already. Um, but this is where you can come and find out what your party is doing about it and what your electeds are doing about it and find out how you can fit into that. So um, every Saturday, that's not a holiday. The first Saturday of every month, that's not a holiday. Come on in. And next month, I really want us to spend some time um, on what the party has been doing and how you might uh, fit into that. And also have some time for electeds to think, to talk with us about what they're doing about the state of the world we find ourselves in. Helene, you want to pop right up real quick? Helene is a director of um, voter protection, deputy director of voter protection for the state of Michigan. I mean, not the state, for the Michigan Democratic Party, the state party. And she needs a little assistance from our neck of the woods. Great. I want to thank Teresa for inviting me to um, come out. 2024 is going to be an all hands on deck year for Democrats in Michigan. Um, I'm with the voter protection team and we do a very specific job statewide. We are responsible for um, the election process, starting from when people turn out to the polls to vote all the way through the voting certification process that makes the vote official in the state. So we don't do canvassing. We don't do get out the vote. We're responsible for the point at which people start voting. So what does that mean in practice? We're responsible for making sure that we have a statewide team of uh, volunteers that do things like monitor the early voting sites, monitor polling uh, stations on election day, monitor clerk's offices um, during early voting as well. Um, we are organizing a statewide team of people who monitor the um, absentee voting counting boards. And we need people to monitor the board of canvassers, canvassing of the elections. And as we know, there was some funny business with the Wayne County Board of Canvassers last time around. Um, this is an under... Um, appreciated but absolutely crucial part of the election process for which, whoop, for which we need volunteers. Oh, okay, great. Good, good, good. Are you on the board of canvassers? Okay. We also, these are roles for people who want to do things in person. We also have vote, phone banking opportunities. Um, now in Michigan, we have a formal process for curing absentee ballots that have some kind of deficiency. The MDP is going to be running phone banking for um, people who want to help voters who've received notice that their ballot has been rejected. These are people who turned out to vote. For, they forgot to sign the um, envelope and their ballot's been rejected. We are going to need help um, calling those people to make sure that they correct the deficiency in their ballot. Um, we also have a hotline for um, Michigan voters if um, you prefer to do something like that. We have lots of um, voting uh, volunteer opportunities. In terms of Washtenaw County, we have four priority um, jurisdictions in Washtenaw County, Ann Arbor, of course, Ypsilanti City, and um, the township, and also Pittsfield Township. Washtenaw County Dems are a first-rate group. You guys always step up to the plate, but we're going to need even more volunteers. We have some problems getting volunteers in the eastern part of the county. Um, so we're looking for people who would be willing to um, travel a little distance when it comes to um, volunteering. What can you do to volunteer? So if you have any questions at all about any voting uh, volunteer opportunities, um, you can contact me. But you can sign up to volunteer with voter protection through our 
um, dedicated web address, which is michigandems.com backslash voter protection. Very simple to remember. There's a voter a volunteer interest form. Um, there's lots of opportunities to designate which kind of voter protection work you'd like to do. And last but not least, of course, we're all focused on November, but we're urging people to get involved as soon as possible. There's training for all of the voter protection roles, and we would really love people to join us for the February round of training. Um, get trained now. Volunteer in February. Get some experience when the stakes are not sky high. Then you can get more experience in August when the stakes are a little higher, but you'll get more experience. And that way, our team will be so experienced by November, we'll be able to meet any challenge at all that comes our way. So um, thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much for volunteering with the uh, uh, Michigan Dems. And as I said, if you have any specific questions, feel free to get in touch with me. Thanks, Helene. If if people so it's it's michigandems.com, not dot org, michigandems.com slash voter protection. Yep. The whole phrase. Okay, voter protection. It's a Did, voter protection team, so it's just voter protection. Okay. So if they want to contact you personally, is that the best way to do it? That would be one way to do also you have my email address. I do, yeah. So um okay, I'll get my don't email. trip here. I don't want you to you fall. You okay. can get my email address from Teresa as well. I can give you my personal cell. It's 248-850-0066. Thank you. And Helene, we need voter protection leads in Ipsy Township and Ipsy City, correct? Yes. So. Ypsilanti, please get in touch with me. We, Ypsilanti? No, I can't call Oh, okay. But Annie, great. You can help find the right people. Okay. Wonderful. Thanks, Annie. Great. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks for all your work, Helene. It's really so much. So, okay. Um, how about if the panel starts to make their way forward? And I just want to uh, thank um, Eli Nathans, the program committee co-chair Eli Nathans and Loretta Codrington for putting this together. And also Kathy Wyatt, um, who is not only my... Uh, Yoda, but is also, I understand, the sheriff's Yoda. So, <laughs> so very, very thankful to have Kathy involved in the MDP or the WCDP as always. Um, and then we have some new thanks to Sharon Simonton. We have some new wonderful volunteers on the um, programs committee whose name are, are, are escaping me right now. But thank you for all of your work on this. One more thing, one more time. Don't forget, if you have not signed the petition to get Debbie Dingle on the ballot, do it now. It's out on the table. If you want to take one home uh, and, and circulate it among your friends, feel free to do that. Uh, super, super important. And um, oh, I also want to say we have so many wonderful volunteers in this organization, so many. And we're having a celebration. We want to celebrate all of you outstanding, incredible volunteers without whom you know we're nothing. Without you, we're nothing. Seriously. So on uh, February 11th, it's a Valentine. Uh, on February 11th here, from 3 to 5 in the afternoon, we're going to have a special volunteer celebration. And I want you all to have that on your calendars. Okay. Um, Kathy? Well, I think we had a couple more things we wanted to do. before the Sorry. Panel. Go, go, go. Well, I know they're, they're, they got a cramp, but come on up while we talk. Yeah, J Justin, go. Yeah, we wanted to get questions, right, for the next meeting. Y yeah, we're thinking about the... the um, the court ruling. Sorry, Ernesto. What court was it? Why don't you go ahead and take it from here? The, the court ruling invalidating or ordering our uh, citizens redistricting committee to more than a dozen seats. 13, I think. Yeah. 13 seats in, in Detroit. Yeah. So we wanted to provide some education on that at the next meeting. So if there are questions now, um, so we can figure out who would be the best couple of people probably to come and answer those kinds of questions. Does anybody have thoughts about that or questions? We could take them now. You do? Okay. I'll get you next. My so question. Write the question down. <laughs> My question is: uh, Considering the reports on the dysfunction in the existing committee, do they need a mediator? Is there a way to 
make a process for them to get a mediator. Okay. Uh, 13 districts, but if we, they can be rearranged without touching any other districts, that we need to know that. Are they contiguous? Can we move voters from one district to another to balance it correctly? Or do we have to start waving those changes out into other districts? That's a good one. Anybody else? Question? Nope, not pointing at me. Uh, okay. Well, I think we'll try to find a few people to come be able to answer those kinds of questions. Maybe Kathy is going to do something else. I'll just give a quick update, too, from the county. Uh, there was a great MLive article that talks a bit about what we're looking to do over the next year. Uh, just to give you three high-level things, uh, we're going to be looking to figure out how do we maintain programming that we funded through the American Rescue Plan. Uh, we're going to be having a lot of conversations about millages. Everybody likes millages, right? Yeah. That's, uh, there's a number that need to be renewed uh, and maybe a potential new one. Uh, and, and those are two of the high level ones. Uh, but there's a great MLive article, a nice picture of me on there. I don't know if you've seen it. Uh, but yeah, we'll circulate it. We'll circulate it. I don't want to take up too much time from the panel. Uh, and I think you were going to mention something about that's relevant to the panel. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, I think most people know this, that I work full time for Senator Irwin. Um, a few things that he's working on that tie into this panel. He's been working for really the last decade to improve um, literacy um, training um, by making that um, change to state law. Um, so we have a few bills in the Senate and one House bill that are part of a package to um, require assessments earlier for earlier screening, um, as well as changing st uh, standards for teacher preparation. And then the House bill um, would create an advisory committee within the Department of Education at the state level. Um, Michigan is like not last, but close to last um, on literacy laws. And so um, we desperately need to change things at the state level that way um both teachers and districts are better prepared to catch signs of um dyslexia earlier on and other challenges with reading um and then kathy also wanted me to address some other education related things that we're working on the other topic that we're working on is actually really relevant in my opinion to literacy because often kids that get kicked out of school the school to prison pipeline Oftentimes those kids have issues with literacy. So we're working um, with Student Advocacy Center on improving um, improving laws that would prevent kids from getting kicked out and expelled and long-term suspension. So we um, we have a zero, we changed the policy about a decade ago, but it didn't really get to the core of the issue. So kids are still getting kicked out and getting really long um, uh, expansions and expulsion. So two relevant things to this topic. Thanks, Annie. And as Kathy makes your way, I'm just going to make one quick announcement and another M Live article, actually, if you haven't seen it, um, about an amazing award from the state uh, health, health and Human Services to the Washtenaw County Sheriff's Office, nearly a million dollars for their incredible community engagement work. Um, also, you know, interrupting the interrupting the path from disadvantage and disinvestment to prison and bad outcomes. It's uh, community violence intervention work. Maybe you want to say more, um, but it's just absolutely incredible work. And I think we should be, we are so proud of our electeds and thankful for our electeds. So thank you. Thank you. Kathy, finally. <laughs> so um, I do think we should acknowledge our Director of Community Engagement, Derek Jackson. Please give a little wave. Um, he has, for the Washtenaw County Sheriff's Office, led our CVI efforts. So thanks to him, thanks be, uh, to the sh Sheriff Jerry Clayton, we are doing amazing, innovative work that is saving lives. So thank you, Derek. I'm glad you're here. Um, so we are here today for this panel about the literacy crisis in Washtenaw County. And for some of you, both in this audience and online, you, uh, you don't know that there's a literacy crisis. Ann Arbor is the most educated city in the country. Yeah, 
really. And so people think everything's okay, particularly if you live in Ann Arbor. And for some folks, everything is okay. But for so many of our children, particularly those children who live in, and I say this intentionally, live in segregated pockets of generational poverty, things are not okay in Washtenaw County. And the poverty we already, before COVID, before the pandemic, had challenges around reading, driven in, in great part by the historical structural racism that created the poverty that creates challenges for so many families and children. So you add to that the pandemic, COVID, and there are kids who were already in families and kids who were struggling with literacy, with learning to read, with the supports they needed. And all of a sudden they lost two years of learning to read, of building on reading, of supporting reading. And the result is not just a serious problem. It is a crisis. Because what is going to happen in a future based moving more and more toward information, technology, uh, learning um, based, if you can't read or can barely read. So what, what today we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about the crisis. We're gonna talk about what people, the panelists are seeing and what we can do about it. It is a solvable crisis, but it's going to take a village. It's going to take a community. It's going to take a county. It's going to take state legislators, but it's, it is solvable. So let's move forward. Um, and I'm going to ask our panelists to introduce themselves and say a little bit about their organization. So the first one is uh, Kelly Michael. Would you like to introduce yourself and, and say what you do? Um, I don't know. Hello? Is okay. it, it's on. Good okay. morning, everyone. I am Kelly Mickle. I'm the extremely proud principal at Erickson Elementary in Ypsilanti Community Schools. My school serves grades one through five. And um, just to note at this point, yes, this is a crisis. I have fifth graders going into middle school who are struggling to read. I have a current fifth grader who is doing um, Family Learning Institute from grades two through four. And in fifth grade, his family is like, can they please get back in that tutoring program? Um, because it helped him so much. So am I just doing an introduction right now, Kathy? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but however, yes, but however, um, anytime you want to help the, this group here and online understand the, the crisis, that's forgivable. <laughs> <laughs> Ernesto. Sure. Hey, everybody. Um, my name is Ernesto Carriero. I serve on the Ann Arbor School Board. Um, today, I'm on the panel as a representative for Books for Kids, which is a nonprofit that our family started about seven years ago. Uh, so we started pre-COVID. Um, at that time, our organization shipped uh, books internationally to the Philippines. Um, I travels to the Philippines. My heritage there is what inspired us. And then when COVID hit us a little bit, we realized that our efforts can be very local uh, on literacy. Uh, we usually would ship books and then we found locally where we could do some of that uh, good work for literacy. We've done a couple of book fairs over at Erickson. Um, obviously, I teach at Washtenaw Community College uh, professionally, um, so I'm in a unique position to be able to see students who graduate all the way through K-12. Um, and when they come to the community college, which is often for some of them the only place that they can go or they have the opportunity to go, we'll often see students who graduate from high school who have some very basic, maybe what we would call fifth or sixth grade reading and writing skills. And oftentimes they get um, placed in developmental courses. Um, and so we do a lot of work trying to make sure that they're what we call college ready. 
Um, but I definitely see that early intervention with literacy could really prevent a lot of that. Um, so that's how I'm coming to you to today on this panel to talk about literacy all the way through the spectrum, uh, like so many of us do, all the way from um, early reading, even from birth, all the way up until post-secondary. Go ahead. Uh, Good morning. I'm Shireen Budden. I'm the executive director of the Family Learning Institute. The Family Learning Institute has been around in uh, Washtenaw County since 2000. And it was established to address the achievement gap in Washtenaw County. And guess what? We still have one 24 years later. Only we see this literacy crisis as more intensive than it's ever been. I am a retired principal from Ypsilanti School, so this is what retirement looks like. Um, but uh, the Family Learning Institute offers uh, reading tutoring to students in grades one through five, and it is a volunteer-based organization. We put together individual plans for reading with every student that we work with, so our students receive one-to-one -one tutoring. That's really essential. And probably the biggest thing you're gonna hear from me today is one-to-one -one and the need for volunteers because that's how we make a difference. We have a wonderful collaboration with Ypsilanti Schools and in Arbor Schools. We have our main site located on South Industrial where we receive students for reading tutoring. And then we have our outreach programs one is located at Dickon Elementary after school. We have another one at North Side, I mean, A2 Steam North Side after school. And then we have a wonderful collaboration in Ypsilanti with Holmes Elementary and Erickson Elementary. And I think we have around 54 to 60 kids enrolled in that program. Caroline, who's in the back, and I'm glad she took her mask down because I wasn't sure that was her is the director of that program. And that is both before school and then a large number of students that are receiving tutoring virtually. So um, we see this reading crisis as much more extensive. Um, we also work with a, a collaboration with Washtenaw County Parks and Rec for summer programming where we offer uh, academic support to the programs to uh, three programs in Ypsilanti throughout the summer. It continues, it never stops. Um, do you want me to continue talking about what I've seen or should I just do the introduction? More to, more to come later. Happy New Year, everyone. <laughs> My name is Kalista Marie and I am the founder and executive director of Our Community Reads. I also work at the Ypsilanti District Library, the Superior Branch, and yes, it does exist. A lot of people don't realize that. They think we're Whitaker. We are not. Um, and our Community Reads is an organization that was established in 2020 in the midst of the pandemic. And it started out as a YouTube channel. Never saw what it is now. I never saw this coming. Um, but we have a YouTube channel where we have story times that families can tune into and they can see the likes of Ellie Sabbath reading to their children before bedtime. They can see all types of Jerry Clayton, Derek Jackson. So um, we are very committed to creating safe spaces for black children to feel seen and valued, empowered and celebrated. And what that looks like is it's about relationship and it's, it's, it's about creating a safe environment for our children to learn about all different types of stuff, reading, life skills, because when you think about it, we all learn better when we feel safe, right? Nobody likes to feel dumb. Nobody walks into a room like, there's no way I'm going to learn this. I'm ready to go in. And I've realized when I had the opportunity, when I worked at Erickson with Kelly Mickle, who I adore, when I worked there, and did a lunch bunch. I think that was the biggest lesson that taught me how children respond to being in environments where they feel like they can't and how other kids tease them and how that makes children shut down and act out. So as important as it is to get books in the hands of children, 
I have also realized that what this culture has created, this culture of children who reading, like even just story times is not their norm. And working at the library has really made that like big in me because I do baby story time and I work with some amazing librarians who do toddler story time. And there's so much that children learn when we sit and read with them from the time they're in the womb. And this just becomes part of their norm, being able to sit, being able to engage, being curious, being able to bounce around, but you're still not saying, sit down. So, okay, let me bring it back. I get real excited, but- so, uh, can We need to move to- Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Uh, that's me. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, I feel like I'm peeking over the podium here at everyone over there, but um, <laughs> I can see you all. Um, my name is Betsy Durant, and I'm the executive director of the Children's Literacy Network. I've been with the Children's Literacy Network now for seven plus years, which seems almost impossible <laughs> for those of you who know when I started, Shereen, right? Um, but CLN has actually been around since 1991. Uh, we started as a book giving organization where we were a book giving charity. And we moved from that about seven years ago to realizing that to have the greatest impacts, you really needed to have direct interactions with the children. And so we have four core programs. I know I don't have time to run through all of them. I'll just go through quickly. But the main thing I want to say about our programs is we tr have tried to create a continuum of services because we realize that the more touch points you have with children as they go through their reading experiences, the better and the greater the impacts are going to be. So we have the Read With Kids program, which starts in preschool, follows them to kindergarten through first grade. Then we have our Book Pals program, which uses a peer-assisted learning strategy um, where third graders get to read with the second graders and they become, they gain confidence in being the leader in that. And the second graders get that intrinsic motivation because they want to read really well for their reading buddy. Um, and that's second and third grade. And from there, we have our um, Reader's Theater, Reading Stars Reader's Theater program that takes place over the summer months um, where children actually get to create a production. So they're super excited and they forget the fact basically that they're reading and practicing reading um, for with those scripts. And then finally, we have our Family Literacy Interactive Program Nights, which brings everything full circle because we're working with the family unit as well as the children, which is so vitally important important um, to establishing those reading skills at home that can happen as well as in the schools. So we're both in the schools. Um, we're at Erickson um, and, and uh, Estabrook as well as Holmes. We're at Ford and Perry with our Read With Kids. And then we, as I said, extend everything back to the whole family unit and we hold those flip, flip nights at the schools that we are in. Um, so uh, what we're going to uh, talk about now, now that you, we've introduced all of our panelists, um, all of whom do absolutely wonderful work and all are my friends. Um, and we're going to talk about what Kelly started that conversation about what each of them, because they all work with kids, they're all what they are seeing around literacy challenges, what they are seeing um, that makes this a crisis. So if you can all kind of talk about that, um, what you, the, the challenges around literacy that you're seeing. Kelly, can you take that away? Kelly is upfront and close to what's going on. I am. At being the principal of Erickson. Thank you. And it's almost like there are so many challenges. I don't know where to start. Um, so I will just kind of take it back to COVID. Um, and, and say at the point we were at before COVID hit, we were not a high performing school or district. We still had literacy challenges, still that kind of crisis feeling, um, because there's that whole notion that you learn to read until third grade, and then you read to learn starting in third grade. And when a child gets to third grade and they don't have the basic reading skills, such as phonics to be able to sound out words and start that process of blending and, and learning to read, um, 
they're lost. Just like Miss K was saying, Miss K, Calista Marie also goes by Miss K. <laughs> um, and so during the pandemic, we were scrambling and we felt like we were really putting together the best possible learning experience virtually that we could. There's just so much you cannot do screen to screen. Um, and so coming back into the building for in-person learning, um, it was a struggle because then they're learning how to do school in person again. Um, and the pandemic created many challenges that families and students are facing outside of school, which they bring into school, which takes away the time that we have to provide quality instruction. So it's just this, it's just this like big mess of challenges creating this crisis. Um, and so we're just seeing that kids can't, perform. Even in math, our math curriculum requires a lot of reading, even at the younger grades. So when you look at the math curriculum and the instruction teachers are doing with them and their, their math books, it requires them to read a lot in order to even get to the math concepts. And so not only are they falling behind in, in the reading and others, that's creating them to fall behind in math as well. Um, and like Ms. Kay was saying, the confidence isn't there. So when students aren't feeling confident, safe, and comfortable, they're distracting themselves to sort of get out of that uncomfortable, unsafe feeling. Um, and it's just really, the biggest thing we need is more human resources and more time. And we can't produce that as a school, as a district. We do a lot of things. So I, I don't know if this is the time to list what we do. Um, but every single person on this panel is a partner with Erickson and YCS. We're bringing every possible community support program grant that we can get our hands on to get more people working with students. And Shireen and I were talking out in the lobby today, and the idea of every single student in my school had a person that wasn't their teacher that connected with them, that tutored them, that worked with them, that supported them, that just cared about them, I think we would see a huge difference in the lives of kids and how they are able to be successful at school. Because don't get me wrong, all of our kids are successful in some area at school. Um, but that reading part is the piece that's really creating the biggest challenge for them and for, for the school, for the teachers to be able to figure out how do I balance what they need? I have a student who can't even do letter ID in second grade while I have a student reading fluently in second grade. How do I meet all those individual needs? It's a really big challenge. Um, but we do. We put a before school program in place called the Grizzly Sunrise Club. And that was partly put in place to accommodate families who had to work before our school change time change started to be a later time. But the idea behind that is not child care. It's an opportunity for additional instruction and support in academics. Um, and we have about, at Erickson, 35 students coming on a daily basis. And there's three staff members working with them. So they're getting some additional small group support. But the more people we could have working with them, the better each child could progress. Um, we also work with the Family Learning Institute, which was explained, and we have a good chunk of students involved in that, getting in-person tutoring in um, the morning, one day a week at Erickson. Like they actually come to us and kids, families bring their student there for that tutoring experience. Um, and then sh they also offer that virtual piece for those who've been in the tutoring program who can't necessarily come in before school. Um, we do book pals with Children's Literacy Network. Our community reads supports us in so many ways and has come in and done lunch groups. Um, we have U of M readers come in and just read with kids and, and create fun reading opportunities, not just intensive skill building instruction. Um, we do the book giveaways with Ernesto and Lisa and um, also through our district has a grant for um, being able to provide students books that they can take home. Um, and our school, we started something called Pastries for Families. So our Title I intervention teacher hosts a family meeting, if you will, um, once a month 
we provide pastries because families come when there's food. So the more funding for food for our events to support families helps us bring the more families in. Um, and that's an opportunity for families who are able to come to learn some strategies um, to use at home when they have the time to be able to make that support or learn some different programs um, that they can just expose their children to. The library information was shared. Um, we had one of these events right before break started. And so we're just trying to connect families to the community and to the school and to build those relationships and um, build that sense of community. And we have our family fun. We always call everything fun, even though it all has an academic focus, because oftentimes we've noticed over the years that if we're like, we're having a, a reading night, they don't all come. But if we're having a family fun night and reading is part of it, they come, especially if there's food. <laughs> so we try to do all sorts of things that help families feel safe and comfortable because families need to feel safe and comfortable at the school also. Um, so that's another big piece of getting family engagement around building academics. Um, and then during the school day, we have Title I intervention teachers. We have Reading Corps, which is um, from America, 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 America Reads, sorry. Um, and they bring in uh, one to two full-time teachers who work one-on-one -on -one with a very regimen program. Um, and they help students build those basic skills. And then eventually, once the students master those skills, they're out of the program because they got what they needed and they can be successful in the classroom. And we also um, do something at Erickson we call Empower Hour, which is a very specific designated time of the day where every single grade level, so all the classrooms in that grade level are doing Empower Hour at the same time. That gives us the ability to maximize instructional time, which means if a student has an IEP and they're getting special education services, their special education service provider works with them during that Empower Hour time. Our Title I teachers work with those students who qualify for Title I services during that time. And then teachers have the opportunity to work with small groups or individual students on the skills they need to build while other students are perhaps doing like Imagine Learning, which is one of our online platforms um, where they can practice those skills and get instruction. It's just digital. Um, and we have a program we use called Phonics First. And primarily it's used at the lower grade levels, like that preschool and early elementary level. And we are now implementing it at third grade with fidelity because they don't have those phonics skills. And I have fourth and fifth graders that I alluded to when I was talking too much in my introduction that don't have the skills they need either. And so it's just, it's, it's like a literacy pandemic, an illiteracy pandemic, if you will. Um, and so, and then to the point that Ernesto, you were talking about college ready skills. When I came to Erickson, this is my ninth year at Erickson and in the six, yeah, right. <laughs> in the 16, 17 school year, our building decided we wanted to to pursue being a leader in me school. And that um that means that we practice the seven habits of highly effective people. And the reason why I wanted to bring that into Erickson at the elementary level was because I was the principal at Ypsilanti New Tech High School for the first two years of YCS. And in our partnership with Washtenaw Community College, um, it was just stated and reiterated over and over again, your students are great, but they don't have the soft skills they need to be successful in college. So I thought, okay, I'm going to bring that soft skill instruction to the elementary level. And it's been going great. But it's not reading instruction. It's not what it, they need this, right? But they also need that additional intensive reading instruction and literacy support. And then we have the third grade reading law, which in theory, it's a decent concept, but it's ineffective. We didn't get any resources or supports we just got told a whole bunch of things we need to do with kids and document and and then hold them back if they and, and it, it's not good for kids. <laughs> so we do need some legislation that's actually good for kids that supports all the efforts we're making to build those literacy skills, help them be not just college ready, work ready, 
community ready? How, how do we be successful member of our community? Um, so those are the things that we're doing. And we're doing all of those things because we are seriously in a crisis of not being able to get our students where they need to be with the amount of time and resources we have with them. And I would say that to Shireen's point, more volunteers, the better. The more volunteers we have to support kids, the more opportunities that kids have, and the more kids can be served. Thank you, Kelly. So if you haven't noticed, Kelly is one of the most committed educators and principals you could ever find. And if there, and I can tell you um, the people on this panel agree on a lot of things. And one of them is absolutely how wonderful Kelly is and Erickson. So thank you so much. Um, we have somebody who was trying, who ran into a bit of an obstacle getting here, um, but never gives up. <laughs> so uh, Daryl Johnson, uh, if you would introduce yourself uh, and talk about your, tell us a little bit about your organization, and then uh, you can go ahead and, and um, pass it to Ernesto. Uh, but if you want to introduce uh, yourself first and mentor to you, so we, so folks know who you are. Okay, thank you all. Uh, sorry for being late. I uh, got locked out the house this morning. Then the guy came with the key and didn't have the key to my place. So there we go. But anyway, I'm Daryl Johnson, Executive Director of Mentor to Youth. And uh, I think what I would speak to most quickly is that when kids can't read, they don't want to admit it, right? The shame and the guilt of it. And as I deal with middle school kids who can't read, I have a nephew that's in prison, and he told me the other day, he says, the sign when you walk into the prison says, leave all your hopes and dreams right here. That's what the sign says. And when you can't read, really, you've already left your hopes and dreams at that space, right? And so this is a, a, this is a war, right, when, we're, when we really talk about illiteracy, right, and what we're preparing our kids for. Uh, I have the privilege of working up close with kids, and I was really blown away last year when I was working with a young lady, and she just said to me, Mr. Johnson, you know I can't read. And I thought, first I thought, you know, I was just so taken back for by it, but then I thought about that we have enough relationship that she can readily admit that to me. And I think that's one of the biggest pieces that happens is, like, we have the, we have the know-how but we don't have the relationships that get through the guilt and the shame, right? So that people can uh, have a chance, no matter what trauma or drama they have lived through, uh, they can have a chance to learn how to read. Um, I think of black people being in slavery and not being allowed to read, right? And here we are in 2024, and our kids still can't read. There's something wrong with that. And um, so I'll just leave my introduction there and get to any other questions. So, so Ernesto, do you want to address what you're seeing in all of your sure. various capacities, sure. um, the challenges uh, around um, literacy and reading? Sure. You know, um, I agree with so much of what you said about um, so many different programmings. I'll come at it a little differently. Um in all the work that we've done through our org um, and through teaching, I kind of see it in two ways. Number one, the easier part is to try to create excitement around reading and literacy. Uh, it's the reason why um, we want to bring free books to students wherever they are in those spaces um, to make it access free. We try to imagine a space where you, you'll all remember the Scholastic Book Fair that you might've had at youth. The problem with the Scholastic Book Fair is if you don't have any money, you don't get to leave with any books. So, so the, the idea that a student could come to a book fair and leave with the book without any commitment beyond just selecting and getting excited about it, that's part of the excitement we wanna create around literacy. Um, I was at an event with Kalista, I think it was last summer. Um, I think we were at a local church and we brought a, an array of books and um, one student opened the book and smelled it. 
Um, and the excitement around smelling a new book that was in that student's hands, it's inspiring. Um, so from that perspective, all of these partnerships that, um, that we've heard about with the public schools, with the library, in our community spaces, that's trying to generate that excitement, that idea that literacy is just beyond something that you have to do, but it's something that you should get excited about. Um, the other perspective I'm going to talk about is the instruction uh, perspective, um, which is that we just need to do more phonics instruction um, in those early grades of K through three and hope that we can eventually um, do away with what we know isn't working for students, which is guided reading. Um, so the idea of the science behind reading, we really want to make sure that they have control and, and really awareness of those phonic sounds and how they're put together uh, so that they're not looking at pictures and, and putting together maybe I can guess it's this picture or maybe I, I can guess it's that one, but to really focus on the phonics um, so that they can take those skills and learn with relative ease with the assistance of their parents without having to sit through a whole guided cueing strategy, but that they could actually look at those letters and make sounds and create words from one syllable words all the way to the end. So I really see our literacy crisis in those two spaces. Number one, to create a little bit of excitement around literacy. I think that's what all of our organizations are trying to do. And, and that doesn't just happen uh, from the womb, but all the way up into adulthood. And number two, to really within our structured systems, once kids go to school, that they are learning phonics and that they can take that and apply that phonics uh, when they go home and have those practice for those books or wherever they are. Um, so that's how I see our, our literacy crisis um, unfolding before our very eyes for many, many, for, for decades um, now. Um, and I will speak to what I think all of us in the Literacy Coalition know it, it's going to take people to be able to do that. Um, in all of these programmings and all of these spaces, I think uh, we have a real effort to try to find volunteers to, who will be able to step up and do that in our community. So Shireen, do you want to uh, take it away and, and talk about what you're seeing? And we'll give uh, Daryl a chance to catch his breath. Okay. <laughs> and well, we do appreciate you making it here despite all the challenges. Well, listening to um, Kelly, I think um, I couldn't imagine having a school have more things happening to focus on literacy than what's happening at Erickson School. And yet there's still a crisis. Um, one of the things that I we see at Family Learning Institute, we work with students that are one or more grade levels behind. But I have to say that the vast majority of the kids we're working with are far more than one grade level behind. They're two and three grade levels behind. And if you know brain research, you know it takes a lot to try and fill that kind of a gap. And it doesn't happen overnight. It happens with repetition, repetition, repetition. We ask the teachers to give us input on what they see their students need. So not only do we get the assessments information from them, and we do an assessment ourselves, but we ask the teachers to give us the input. What does your child particularly need. And we see it over and over again, phonics, 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 phonics. That's the basis of the crisis our kids are missing. The older students are struggling with comprehension, but most of the time the comprehension struggles come from them struggling to decode those words because they don't have the phonics, phonics skills. When the kids came back from from the pandemic and they first started being a uh, seeing them in person, we saw really basic skills that they should have had, they didn't have. I was amazed when we opened our first in-person summer camp with our students and our, our youngest ones, our, our second graders did not know how to handle a pencil. Now think about why, because they went through a full school year without having, holding a pencil. Our first graders didn't know how to cut. They didn't know how to use a crayon because those basic skills are taught in person. 
and the skills that they were missing through academic instruction, although the teachers were really working hard on providing the best virtual instruction they knew how to, kids can't get it virtually. They just don't learn the same way they do in person. That one-to-one -one contact was so key. And I know from talking with principals and teachers at various schools that a lot of our students just weren't attending either. So the attendance was a huge problem for virtual instruction. And now we're left with trying to fill in the gaps. And the standards haven't changed. That's what's amazing to me. We're still being held to those same state standards. And we had a COVID crisis. And now we have a literacy crisis. And what's happening? I don't know what's going to happen with those reading standards. But I know that the only way we're going to be able to address this is with help. Helen mentioned it. We need human resources, people, individuals that are ready and willing to connect with students. We use that term, it takes a village. Are we not the village? What are we doing? We're talking about it. It's time to stop talking and it's time to start doing. We can't have student after student, third graders and fourth graders, they can't decode words because they don't know phonics. And then expect them to meet fourth grade standards and move on to fifth grade. Makes no sense. It makes no sense. We have to attach ourselves to the children in our school district and have an impact. It's time to step up, step forward and do something. One-to-one -one is the only thing that has the greatest impact. It takes individuals. Everyone spoke about the importance of that one-to-one -one connection. Children will become vulnerable when they know that someone is invested in them and they will only start to open up and learn once they become vulnerable. They have to be comfortable and know that it's okay for me to tell you that I don't know this and now I'm willing to hear from you how do I learn this? It's time for us to start truly being a village. Thank you, Shireen. So um, can you pass the mic to Kalista? Oh. And Kalista, <laughs> could you, you had spoken and you often speak about the importance of relationships and building those relationships with our kids. Uh, can you talk about what you are seeing in terms of the challenges um, for the, the, the kids you interact with around literacy and, and, and talk a little bit more about the importance of connecting with them and committing um, and then having those relationships. I'm trying to figure what Kelly said is so true. There's so much. Yes. You just don't even know where to start. And it's like, it's like an iceberg. You know what I'm saying? And it's trying to figure out what point of the iceberg do you want to speak to? Um, what I can say is that working at the library, seeing young people come to the library to get on the computer, right? You don't have an adult there that's saying you have to go read this book for 10, 15, 20 minutes, which I see a lot of families do that. Then you can get on the computer. A lot of our children don't have that. So they come to the library and they're governing themselves. Sometimes it's more of a challenge than others. And they're on the computer. Computers are amazing tools, but when you're not shown how to balance your time with, okay, we're gonna read and then we're gonna do this. I think that is part of the challenge. Um, what, what I have seen is I have seen kids, I have, an, I have a program called Queens Club that started in spring of 2021. And I remember, and it works with young black girls ages third grade through eighth grade. We do have a few ninth graders because I refuse to let them go. And I've had them since they were like in fifth grade. So 
what I have seen is how people can be cliquish, right? You know, we go to the people that we know and we've had to break up little spats over the years. What I have seen that morph into, because we meet once a month, first Sunday of the month, and we have food together. We always read a story. Um, we've had a lot of guests come in talking about all different types of things, financial literacy, whatever. But I remember how much they used to tease each other and how we were always putting out little fires. We just had our Christmas Queens Club in December and we read a book called The 12 Days of Christmas. Um, and I had the book go around the room and I had each girl read out loud. Some girls struggled to get through that book. But what somebody pointed out to me after we were done is they, because we have some siblings in our group and they said, but do you notice that nobody laughed? Did you see how supportive everybody was? Everybody was like looking with anticipation, like you're struggling, but you can do it. I'm not just going to jump in and help you. You can do it. And then they were sitting next to their sisters and their sisters were helping them gently with compassion. How much more are you willing to continue trying something that's hard for you? when you're in an environment like that. And sometimes our children don't get that when they're in a classroom, like, like Kelly spoke of when you're in a classroom and the behaviors, you have so many behaviors that you're having to put out fires. So there can be a lot more teasing that gets done. And words are powerful. Words can shut you down until you're in your thirties in therapy. Right. And so it's so it's so important to create environments where our children are not riddled with shame at what they don't know. And there's a video and I just want to say this and then I'm going to pass the mic. There's so much more I could say, but there is a video. We did a trauma training at the library and there is a five minute video. And I really encourage everybody to look it up on your YouTube and watch it when you get a chance. It's called the survival brain versus the the survival brain versus the learning brain. And in that video, a man really clearly states in simple terms, the difference between a student that comes into a classroom ready to learn and what that looks like in their brain compared to a child that comes in with all this heavy trauma on their back and they're dealing with it day in and day out and how they interact with the idea of not knowing how the day is gonna go, what's gonna happen. And then the importance of having adults around you that help you to feel safe and how that allows you to be free to learn, free to play without somebody saying, why are you doing that? Why are you sagging? Why are you doing that? We have to give kids a space to be who they are. They have to know that you see them and that you value them based on who they are before we try and tell them you're broken, how you're walking through this world is broken, I'm going to need to fix you, and then we'll get to the learning. I don't think that's working. Kalista, could you pass to Daryl? Thank you, Kalista. Could you pass to Daryl? And Daryl, could you talk um, a little bit more about what you're seeing, the challenges uh, around literacy? And also one of the things that, um, for those of you who know Daryl Johnson, a mentor to youth, that he is an expert at is building relationships with kids and families. Um, so if you could talk about the challenges around literacy, what you're seeing, because I've seen your frustration um, and uh, pain with what's going on with our kids, and then also talk something about the importance of building those relationships with kids. Thank you. It's, it's, this is a hard topic for me because as I'm sitting here listening, I'm getting angrier and angrier, and then here I go, right? And I, I'm trying to be nice today. Go ahead and be angry. Be outraged. I am. When you think about the inability to read to the third and fourth generation, right? You send a kid home that can't read to a parent who can't read, right? And when you talk about that trauma, I'm talking about I got kids who, I got one kid who saw his father murdered. You're talking about trauma. You're talking about kids who are 
are, are in this world and don't know how to manage it and their parents aren't able to help them manage it because they can't manage their own lives. And then we know if you can't read, you're going to grow up and be poor if you don't go to prison. Right. So the cycle is just continuous. And then we look and we bounce our kids around. This is why I'm in this coalition is because we bounce our kids around from program to program and not really understanding what little Johnny or little Susie needs. Right. But if we as the adults could get on the same page, they couldn't hide out because when they went from one to the other, they would all be getting the same thing. Here's what blew my mind. We had a reading program and, and, and I thought it was good because I'm not an educator, so I don't know. Right. And a lady stepped to me and she said, Daryl, the problem is whole word. We have taught whole word for so long. We don't teach phonics and kids don't know how to decode. But Ernesto was talking about they teach kids to read by the picture. So when you get to a certain grade and you take away the pictures, they don't know what you're speaking about. They have no idea. And then when we try to fix it, we're so busy fixing it, there's no relationship with the child, right? So here that kid is. I got kids who, who intentionally try to get rid of me, right? Because everybody else has left them, right? Why don't you just go on and leave now, Mr. Johnson? Let's make this easy on both of us. And it's like, no, we're not going to leave. And the kids tell me, well, Mr. Johnson, I don't know why you put them out today. You're just going to take them back tomorrow. I have to. Where else is he going but to prison? No skills, soft skills, hard skills, reading skills. Then when the joker ride up on you at the gas station and rob you, you wondering what's wrong. He hungry. I had one of my friends call me this summer and say, hey, man, I got a couple of your kids up here at Dairy Queen. Uh, uh, they want some ice cream. I said, did you buy them some? He said, yeah, the manager told me I couldn't because they've been panhandling. Can you imagine that? Panhandling for ice cream in a country that got this much? This is some desperate situation. So back to reading she says to me, Daryl, the problem is, is this whole language. Who decided? Yeah, who decided this is what was for our kids? And we got to reverse this. But I know I, I don't raise five kids. I didn't know that. I didn't know that this is what they were being taught. We send our kids to school with an expectation that the experts know what they need. So when we go back down and we go back and take our kids backwards, what Shireen was saying, two and three grades behind. That kid ain't gonna just come up to you and just be the jolly, happy, ready to learn kid. You're going to have to spend some time. He's going to have to know that, you know what? You're going to be here next week because he don't believe you're going to be here next week. Right? It takes relationships first. Then we can start to add on. And the reason I'm in this coalition is because I got to make sure that the time I have with a kid, we're doing the right thing, not just a thing. Right? Our kids have got to learn how to break words down. I don't, again, that's just the way I was raised. This with phonics was just automatic. I don't know when we got away from that. I don't know how we got away from that, but it's a crime. Yes. <laughs> that's a hard act to follow, Daryl. <laughs> um. You know, I think that one thing that we're hearing up here again over and over is there are so many pieces to this puzzle and we're all trying to fit them together and do the best that we can. And it is a hard struggle right now. 
when we started CLN in 2019 with our Book Pals program, and we had second graders, and we didn't have the Read With Kids program at the time, we were seeing before COVID children that were coming up that were reading at an emergent level, emergent reading level. That was prior to COVID. You can imagine how that percentage of children went sky high after COVID. And the problems that I know Kelly is facing, and I have so many conversations with Ryan Johnson at Estabrook about this, and it was it was called a crisis prior to COVID. We were having crisis committee meetings at Estabrook, trying to figure out what we could do about this. And, and that's one of the reasons that we created our Read With Kids program. I have to tell you that we don't believe at CLN, and I'm sure everyone here feels the same way, that, that there is a one-size-fits-all solution to this problem. And by that, I mean one-size-fits-all for every child. There is not. One-size-fits-all for every classroom. There is not. And one-size-fits-all for every school that we are working with. There is not. And so we are consistently and having conversations with our team to tweak our model because we recognize that it maybe it doesn't work to exactly do it this way. That doesn't even take into account the social emotional um, struggles that the children are facing that we are working with. And yes, the relationship building is helping with that. Is it solving that? No, it's not completely solving that. So again, we have all these different pieces of the puzzle and we cannot fit them all together without the help of all of you and the community. I know that relationship building and collaborations and partnerships amongst all of us is another piece of solving that puzzle. So Children's Literacy Network, we're really big on creating those partnerships because, you know, it, at the end of the day, every single one of us here has the exact same goal. Our goal is the same. We want the children that we're serving to succeed. Another piece of this that we haven't discussed is, is being tasked with reaching the most needy, the most needy families the most needy children. And there are barriers to doing that. There are barriers such as transportation, right? Not everybody can get to the library, unfortunately, but it is a reality. And if we don't have transparent conversations and honest conversations about what those barriers are, we can't knock them down. So we have to be able to be honest with each other and transparent with each other and talk these things through so that we can reach the entire community and not leave anybody out. I mean, we have, there's so many suggestions that we can have, but with all the suggestions, we need to then ask that question, what is the barrier though? If we create a family literacy initiative, what are the barriers going to be to all families being able to participate in that initiative. We have to have those conversations to even be able to start to figure out how the puzzle is gonna go back together. Thank you very much. So um, one of the things that I'd like this group to talk about a little bit more, and all of you have touched on it is I mean I think it, they people have been pretty clear that we have a crisis when under ten percent of some of our uh, our students at some of our elementary schools under ten percent are reading on grade level the last you know seven point four five point seven we have a crisis and the the what we need to focus on are the things that we can do and the solutions because it is one of the things Shireen said so eloquently 
is it takes a village. We are the village, the folks in this room, the folks on online, our friends, the people we know that we can talk about this to. All of us need to get involved. But it is, um, as Betsy said, a lot of different pieces. So if, any, if folks want to talk just a little bit more about those solutions, um, what you, what we can do, um, please feel free. Uh, Kelly, did you want to start? Sure. Um, so I think getting involved with any one of the organizations up here, offering yourself as a volunteer would be a huge start. I'm going to call out Ryan Griffin because I see him. <laughs> He's one of my people. He's one of my students' people. He takes and volunteers his time to come work with students who I say, hey, Griff, this baby needs you, which I got one. We should talk after. <laughs> um but it, it really does take take everyone to step up and step in and really connect with kids. So if it's not getting involved in one of these organizations, contact me. If you can come one day a week and want to pick one child to, to be their person, that would be a big help because everything we need to do is, is one kid at a time because it doesn't, one size does not fit all in any aspect, which is what makes our teachers' jobs so hard because we start with relationship building and we, in fact, dedicate the first month to relationship building as we fold in the academic pieces. And it's not enough. It's never enough. We never have enough time. We don't have enough resources. Um, and Kalisa, that video, I you all need to watch that video, that one five-minute video of all the trauma-informed trainings I've been part of over all of these years, that one five minutes like summed it up so perfectly and it was so applicable. And so all of my staff got to see it too. And every time we're seeing a hard moment, I'm like, they need their mama elephant right now. And when you watch the video, you'll know what that means. We we're going, we are recording this. And the link will be on our website. And that link to that video, Kalise is going to send me, and that link will be on our website too. So just you, people you know, anybody who, it's not scary to work with kids. It's, in fact, very rewarding. <laughs> so talk to people, anybody who has time a weekday during the school day, after or before school with one of these organizations, but your time and commitment to kids will start to make a difference for our students' learning and their overall lives. Um, I would like to add to that. I, please do contact Children's Literacy Network. We would love to have you volunteer. We have many different opportunities across all of our programs, um, but Family Literacy Interactive Program Nights are one and dones. So if if it's something where you can't be there during the day, um, we have those Family Literacy Active, um, Family Literacy Interactive Program Nights um, where you can just come to one date, one time, work with both the parents and their children um, and make those connections. Um, and hopefully you'll love it and you'll want to sign up for every single date that we have. We're hopefully going to be partnering soon with uh, EMU Bright Future. Shout out over there to Will Spots on that. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yes, please, please, please do sign up. Um, I think that just asking yourself how you can take action, what can you do? Um, there's so many different ways that you can get involved. I'm sure, you know, donating books and things like that, um, you know, is another huge way. But also, if you know of businesses and corporations, you know, this is this is an effort and a movement that we need to, we do need funding. And so, you know, if you know somebody that would, donate to the literacy coalition you know it's the funding will go forever and and cover so many different costs things from books you know to the different lesson plans to the different supplies that are needed um and then of course we're going to be starting the um family literacy initiative campaign and so we're going to need supplies and things for that so you know think about those corporations and businesses because i know ernesto was talking about you know this is all about matriculating all the way up to high school and going on to college and so it benefits the entire community to have 
edu- a more educated workforce, right? So overall, it's it's a huge benefit. And then again, I just want to say parent voices, we need to have parent voices from the communities that we serve to be part of this and, and to be actually speaking towards what their struggles are so that we can understand them even better. So I'm hoping that we also can get more parents involved. Thank you so much. For those of you who are here on the last table by the door and also as you go out on that table, there's a sign up sheets. And if you're interested in learning more, volunteering, donate, you can uh, circle a little form, leave your contact information, and I will call you and we will get you involved. And if um, for those online, you can email me Kathy Wyatt at wyattk at washington.org and we will get you connected with there's a whole range from an hour a week with uh, FLI to uh, the programs Betsy was talking about all different opportunities but it's going to take a village again Kathy Wyatt W-Y-A-T-T at washington.org Kathy Wyatt, Wyatt K. I'm sorry, I think I left my K out. Wyatt K at Washington.org. Um, Ernesto. Yeah, I, I, I'm just going to say one thing. I think to somewhat answer uh, what Daryl posed is um, the idea of how to, how is it going to change? I think it's institutional. I mean, I think when you look at trying to integrate phonics into early classrooms, that is not an easy task. Uh, and the reason why is, is number one, there's resources. Um, of course, publishing companies have a big say in what kind of books go into their schools. And that's why we've had guided reading for 15 to 20 years, because when guided reading was the hot topic 15, 20 years ago, the publishing companies made these textbooks and that's what the resources we have. And we know our public schools are underfunded, so it's not like we can get new textbooks every year. You know, they, they sit every five, six, seven, and I don't think it's out of range to say some some public schools have textbooks probably that are 10 to 15 years old uh, trying to teach those for – in particular for reading instruction. And on top of that, uh, the resources that schools have and, and the restrictions they have on the finances – is also to support our teachers in that change. It's not easy to say, hey, we're going to do phonics, and you've had a teacher who's who's been doing guided reading for 10 to 12 years to expect them to be able to automatically transform that within one year, within two years. So, of course, we want to be able to support teachers in integrating that phonics. I know in Ann Arbor Public Schools, anyways, we've started to get away from that lettering, from that uh, you're at level F, you're at level G, which is damaging in in so many ways to students when when their level isn't corresponding with their grade level. Um, That is very demeaning uh, and and, and really does speak to what we've all talked about, about making sure it's a safe space and that their confidence isn't shot. So so I would say that that's one space institutionally uh, to really work to get rid of. I won't even say get rid of, but to support phonics instruction at the early grade levels and to make sure that we're supporting our teachers that they know are able to do that. Because some of them have been teaching guiding reading if they've been teaching for 12 years. They probably got that instruction in graduate school about this is the right way to do it. They've probably been practicing that for 12 years, which means that in many of them, they feel as if they're experts in teaching guided reading uh, with with very limited success. Um so I'll just leave it at that. I think that's one space where we haven't talked about a lot, but that change in classrooms, I mean, all of our programming is happening on the weekends and after school, sometimes integrated inside of the school model, but it's those school elementary school teachers who have them for those eight hours a day who really need the support in teaching that phonics so that they could, can learn those things. That's all. Thank you, Ernesto. Yeah, I'll suffer with like, you know, I deal with middle school kids and high school kids, so they're, they're so far behind. And my problem is, is that, you know, like what Ernesto is saying is how we change it institutionally. But then I still got my 25 kids that are writing. They can't wait for the change. Right. And so what I look at and I can be totally wrong because I'm not an educator. If. There's 10 blocks to being a 
efficient reader. Block one is phonics. Block two is this and block three is that. What then I need is 10 experts at each block. I don't care if you're in the eighth grade, the sixth grade, the 10th grade. If you don't have no phonics, I need to be able to put you in this phonics block. It's my job to build the relationship to get you there. But when I get you there, I need somebody that knows what they're doing. Right? Because I cannot waste the time or the energy if we get them there. Then once a kid is in this level, now it's up to the kid to excel to the next level. We can give him them options if the spaces are open. A teacher has 40 kids that they trying to work on and trying to get them on. They can't give them that precise. Right. And so we've got to be able to create the spaces. And that's why I love what Shereen doing. Shereen is saying, here, we can do this. If you're here, send them to us. We can get this done. Then we can get you to the next level. We got to know what that level is. I'm not an educator. But Ann Arbor's got to be one of the Ann Arbor's got to be one of the smartest places in the world. We can't figure that out. We can't figure out what the 10 blocks are to becoming an efficient reader. So, Daryl, we got some of those blocks right here. No, we just need go. more support. <laughs> now, I didn't say blockheads. I said blocks. No, 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 no. We do have. That's why we have these programs. And that's why we need the whole, the support of everybody in this room, of all of our village. Um, we're going, we want to make sure we have time for Q&A. Uh, can you pass that uh, mic on to us? So when we look at our kids, we pick up 25 kids door to door. So we know that transportation is an issue. We got too many buses. You can ride around in the churches and the churches got buses sitting on their parking lots. We've got too many things. We got to start cross maneuvering, right? We got the resources. We got the assets. We just not use them. Okay. Y'all can clap. <laughs> Get me, I got me late. <laughs> oh, he gets fired up, and 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 it and it's important to be fired up like that. Um, one of the things that um I wanted to make sure that everyone knows is that if you decide you want to volunteer, we just don't throw you in there and say, "Here's a kid and do your thing." We all provide you guidance. We all provide you direction. And at FLI, because we are a tutoring organization, we provide specific training. And the training takes place in, in small groups sometimes. It's individual, depends on when you jump on. Caroline has a extremely comprehensive training program that she does with her student, with her volunteers. And we have a, a, a very comprehensive training program for the uh, um, volunteers at the rest of the organization. So we don't just plunk you in and say, do it. We show you how. We continuously provide you support. There's um there are certified teachers that are working with our volunteers that will help you learn how to do it and are constantly in connection with you so that you know what to do. If this isn't working for the student, talk to that person. They'll help you figure out what to do next. But we're there to support you. We cherish our volunteers. We would not be able to operate without you and without our volunteers. So we'll do whatever it takes to help you be successful with your students. So we wanted, I wanted to make sure you understood that if you volunteer for any of our organizations, you're not just plunked in and here, go for it. We will support all of the help that you give us and the students that we're working with. In fact, uh... Caroline helps, who is a uh, reading expert, will help um, get lesson plans for each individualized student um, so the volunteer not only is trained, but knows how, has the information on what that specific child needs and what they need to work on. So in all this, there are there each of these groups here, and I don't want to leave Kalist out. We, um, if you have a few more, anything to add about solutions, 
Um, we want to make sure we get that. But keep in mind that all of these groups are going to train. They know what they're doing. They are experts in their field. And they will make sure that you, anyone who volunteers, and we need volunteers, will know what they're doing. Will not, they're not going to be taught to swim by being thrown in the, in the river. You are going to be taught to swim around tutoring and helping the kids learn to read. Kalista. I just wanted to touch on a few things. I will try and keep it very short. I am big on inviting our hero parents as part of our mission to walk alongside us. I've talked to quite a few parents over the years, and I've heard them say things like, well, I don't go up to the school because, Ms. K, I don't know what to say in those meetings. <clears throat> and I remember the first time I heard it, I looked at her because she's so feisty. So to hear her say, Ms. K, I don't, and she, she was so humble. All of a sudden you could hear the little girl in her who was like, I don't know how to show up in this space. And what I think is important is to let parents know First and foremost, don't cuss nobody out. That's first and foremost. Second of all, this is your baby. You don't have to have the perfect words when you go on behalf of your child. And so I'm always encouraging parents like, you know, I've had parents call me and this is what's going on at the school. So I think parent voices are very, very important. But a lot of times they need somebody to walk alongside them to have the courage to go into the school and advocate for their children. And then their children need to see them advocating for them so their children can learn to advocate for themselves. Um, representation. Representation is everything, right? And so I have two young men who are my sons, who I adore. I remember being a young mom and constantly trying to find men to mentor my sons because I was a single mom from the time my oldest, who is now 26, was four. And how 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 hard that was right and so when i connected with ryan griffin when i connected with nate when i connected with justin when i connected with daryl that's why i'm probably such a pain in their side because i'd be like oh my god they show up and i'd be like okay we got this child and we got can y'all come to this because young kids boys and girls respond to black men differently than they do anything else and so anytime you have an education arena and you look and you see very few black men and very few black educators interacting with our kids, they don't see themselves. So when Annie said that they're trying to change things at the, the law level, we need to pay our educators more and we need to be intentional about having representation in our schools, in our school. It, it matters. If you think about if you went to a school as, as a non-black person and all you saw was people that didn't look like you, not honoring your culture, how would that make you feel as a kid? So many people don't have teachers that look like them until they're in college, if they have it then. And then the importance of books that they look at that they can see themselves in. And I'm so grateful for books for kids because I think that that they do an amazing job at that. I'm very intentional when people donate books, um, asking for books that have people, people that look like the children that I serve. It matters. We can try and say, it don't matter. It's, yeah, oh yeah, do. Try and put yourself in a position where you're around people all day long as a child that don't look like you, that's telling you what to do, where to go, how to sit, how to be. And then not even what they saying, just we watch as kids, you watch their sponges, you absorb it, how they walk. My 26 year old still be like, mom, did you see, man, he was fly. Did you see how you walked in the room? Yes, I did. It matters. Representation, diverse books. And we needed, a, we needed a lot because I know we be wearing these brothers out. I know we do y'all, but I love y'all for it. Sean, I'm telling you know, but it's so important. And I'm just so grateful that we have people like Brian Dickerson, Principal Davis, you know, in, in, in those places of leadership in our schools. And I adore Kelly Mickle. And she's always like, Kalisa, if you want to bring them in, you want the black man to, 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 to greet the kids when they come in today, let's do it. Even if we normalize that, 
Like having a day where we have, you know, a whole bunch of black men dressed up, looking fly, greet our kids as they start their school day. Normalizing that. It matters. Thank you, Kalista. We're moving to Q&A now. So if anybody has questions, um, Teresa will bring about, them up. About 10 minutes for Q&A. I'll bring the mic. Getting my steps in. <laughs> Hi, is this on? Can you hear me? My name is Deb Leonard. Um, I am not an educator, but I have worked in the publishing industry and in children's books for about 40 years. No, and that's not true with that. I mean, I was six when I started. But... Um, <laughs> But anyway, I have, and I was wondering, you talk a lot about needing volunteers, and I'm sure you need more than just the 50 people in this room. Do you need books? Do you need books that have representation? There are organizations that will help you with that. Um, First Book is one. I don't know if you've heard that. They um, have new children's books, and they give them give schools and organizations that are dedicated to literacy a deep discount on these books. And they are very cognizant of having books with characters that look like the kids that they're for. Um, that we have a thing that we see in publishing that kids need mirrors and windows. Um, they need uh, windows to see out into the world, but they also need mirrors to see themselves. Um, so luckily, um, and I'm talking about trade publishers, not um, um, academic publishers. They have a lot of the big publishers, most of the big publishers, maybe all of them, have divisions that are focused on African American kids, on Native American kids, on Asian kids. And they have whole publishing programs, not like you just have a book a year that comes out for this. Um, I do have some connections with those people. And if you need help with that, that's something I can do. So... I'd be happy to do this. This is one of my things. Yeah. And also, uh, you, you guys are all teachers who deal with the kids after they get in school. What about before that? I know most um, lower income houses don't have a lot of books. We didn't have books in my house until I was in the sixth grade. But I know they don't have books because they can't afford them because they're trying to feed their kids and pay their rent and every other thing. Um you know, Dolly Parton has her imagination library where she is connected with, I think, mostly um, pediatricians that recommend families for this to be in the program. Washington. Yeah, it's actually Washington Promise, um, which is who yeah. we partner with for our Read with Kids okay. program. They are connected with the imagination library and they do that. The, the one problem I have with that program is they only deal with one publisher because they get really good deals with that publisher. Um, if I, I, my dream in life is to start something like that, but to also include all the other publishers because they're, uh, they deal with Random House. I know Harper has a wonderful program. Scholastic does, Simon & Schuster, all these other people. So if you need help with any of those things, Yes, I absolutely. Can... We do. We still give books with all of our programs. And so and we give um, not only the books that they're reading with and learning to read with um, and doing skill building with, but also we do gifting. So, you know, every, you know, couple of months, we everybody, every single student in that grade gets a book. So we absolutely can use them. And then the same thing with our flip nights. Everybody walks away with the book. It doesn't matter if the child goes to that school or not. Every single child that is attending with their family gets to choose a book. So yes, I would love to have those connections. Thank you. That's great. And then so you know, you know how to reach people. <laughs> yeah, I'll just on the that. pan. We often get, uh, we use first book quite a bit. Um, uh, we, we get orders from them all the time. And um, I think it's important that those books um, go into the spaces where students already are. One of the main, one of the main um, goals of our organization is to go to Erickson, to go with Kalista to out into the community and not feel like to put the burden on the students themselves or the readers themselves to say, Hey, there's an event going over there with the free book. I got to go to that to get my free book. 
but to actually go where there's already an event uh, and, and to bring the books there. And so that's something we've tried to do for years um, in every capacity, I think, with with everyone here, is that if there's going to be an event and there's going to be literacy, let's just bring the books to where they are. Make sure that those books have students uh, students on those covers who look like the students who are there. So it's very intentional. Love to connect afterward. We have another question. Yes, um, I am an educator. I've uh, been since 30 plus after school programming, juvenile detention centers and as well. But the question that I have is how do we get back to phonics? Because I learned to read through phonics and the curriculum is structured in such a way that it's so frustrating as an educator that I apply for the PE position and now I'm physical education because it's like you in the classroom and it's just like nobody up at this level is listening to you. Nobody hears what you're seeing on how to, because we know what to do, but if you're in a position where you begin to work and you begin to do these different things and you're penalized for teaching your kids phonics or what have you. I had principals tell me, hey, stick to the curriculum. And I mean, it, it came at a time when I saw the light bulb going off in my students over their heads, just a classroom full of hands raised in excitement. And here comes walks in the observation of me teaching and the principal says, Hey, where did you get that program that you're working with them on? You know, so how do we, how do we get back to that? Teresa, I think Annie has something to add. Annie, did you want to add to that? Oh, you do, you do need the mic here. <laughs> And then we're we're really short of time, so we're going to do one. Teresa, actually, the clocks here are running. Yeah, these oh. clocks are not right. Eleven <laughs> forty-seven. Right. Not and you've been here a long time. I want to get you out of here. Um, I just wanted to respond to Kalisa's comment about um, funding for educators. Um, for those of you who don't know, Democrats have control of the legislature um, in both chambers and in the governor's office for the first time in 40 years. So um, school funding was a lot different in the last state budget. Um, and I bring that up because, unfortunately, that is at risk every two years when there's an election. Um, we were able to um, get money for school districts across the state had that, that had been burdened for a really long time. They were all predominantly black school districts. So the situations that they were put in were by design. Um, I'm glad that Ipsy schools were one of the school districts that were able to get relief in the tune of $42 million. Um, but what also happened that was in the supplemental in the budget over the summer, the funding formula changed. So schools that have more at risk students actually got more money. So um, that stuff matters. And so I guess I'm just tying it in because we're at a Washington Dem meeting. It matters who we elect and outside of our Washington bubble. It matters um, because we can't continue to invest more in education if we don't have people who care about that stuff, making decisions in Lansing. Um, and we know that funding over time have, has been divested in by Republicans. So I just think it's an important piece of, you know, there are reasons why they don't want to make sure certain student, students um, excel. So I just, it does matter. And paying teachers more and making sure that we have a pipeline of black educators matters. And that also ties into access to higher education. So thank yeah, you, yeah, Annie. Yeah, I... Way to hang on. You guys, we're really almost out of time. And and Eli has a question. So um, or probably from um, everybody online. Hi, everybody online. Welcome. We have dozens of people online. So um, but uh, Annie, thank you for bringing it back to the root, which is why we're here, which is elect Democrats and make sure everybody, you know, is voting for Democrats. Thank you. Actually, this question is for myself. Um, first, is there anyone in the room here from the University of Michigan School of Education? I no. I mean, I mean, I mean, a fact, a, a, a fact, a fact, a faculty member. 
I, I, I invited 30 faculty members from the University of Michigan School of Education. I think there needs to be more conversation. They need that faculty trains our teachers. If they're not learning phonics, it's because they're not hearing these panelists. And okay. and and so that, that's one. Two, um, and I like to ask about EM, EMU. Um, is is there is there a member of the EMU faculty here? I also invited the entire EMU faculty, School of Education faculty. Um, I just want to bring to your attention. Um, I have a personal connection here. My wife leads the FLI Ypsilanti tutoring program. If you haven't picked up a f one of these forms, please get it. It's at the table at the front. I also have extra copies here. It contains both a sign-up volunteer form and also articles about the program. It exactly fits what Mr. Johnson was talking about, to a T, and it needs more volunteers. Thank you. So I think, I, I think we're Thanks. about I it in terms of our time schedule. So um, can I... Can I take one second and just because Caroline has been mentioned so many times, Caroline, would you just stand up and say, hi, Caroline Nathans is uh, running a literacy program that is so, so important and valuable. So everybody, thank you, thank you Caroline. All right. Yeah. So this is it. it uh, Karen Nathans program is in Erickson and Holmes as under the auspices of Family Learning Institute. Um, so we are, we have to have a, uh, it's eleven fifty one. We need five minutes for Teresa to uh, end up. So what I'm going to do and ask the people on the panelists to do is, in one, two sentences, tell you what we want you to remember and take away from this event. And I'll start off. No child's life story should be written when they're nine years old. And the second thing is. It takes a village to solve this kind of problem, to wrap ourselves around our children. So volunteer, volunteer, volunteer. Carolyn has forms. I have a generalized sign up form out there. If you're interested in more information to volunteer, to donate, put your name down there. I will contact you. So I'm asking everybody on the panel in a, you know, a couple of sentences, what you want people to remember and take away. Start one in and now you guys want me to start. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> I would say um, that the many pieces of the puzzle can go together. And I truly believe that it really can happen and it can happen with all of us and it can happen with all of us focusing on those pieces individually and then figuring out how to fit them together. And once we do that, I truly, truly believe that we are going to see success. Um, as an educator in a school, our job is, number one, keep them safe. Number two, educate them and help them realize their potential. Our scholars are not going to be able to realize their potential if they don't have the basic skills they need in order to make that progress and be successful. And we, as educators in the school, can't do it alone. So our community partnerships um, support that. Our community, you know, members being involved in schools supports that. Um, but ultimately, we're here to help kids succeed and realize their potential. And when they don't know, feeling when they don't feel confident in what they're doing, they don't know what their potential is. And so I appreciate being able to be here today um, and being able to communicate this very important message. Um, and I look forward to working with all of you and your friends in the future. Yeah, I'd say thanks uh, for having having me on the panel today. I I can't help but my big takeaway today is phonics instruction. I, th I think that that's, we've heard that in many, many contexts, whether they be in the programming that we're doing in partnership or after school, but also to address the question that was asked institutionally, we need to change some of those materials so that they are phonics based, um, that our teachers are supported in the in in, in that instruction. Again, many teachers, um, if they've been teaching for ten years, they've been taught how to teach reading in a specific way, and um, they need the support and able to show to put phonics forward, um, and that, and that's how I'll leave it. Yep. Gotta keep it short to make Teresa she, happy. She said that when I got the mic. <laughs> I love, I love, yeah. All right, I'm going to try to say this quickly. In the movie Time to Kill, 
Samuel L. Jackson looks at Matthew McConaughey and McConaughey does the closing arguments and he had everybody close their eyes. And at the end, it was, what if it was your kid? What I would like for all of us to take away is that we do have a literacy crisis. It's a crisis. It's truly a crisis and it's time to stop talking about it and start doing something. I just wanted to share that I'm so honored to be, to not only be on this panel, but to know most of the people on this panel and to work with them because they're so passionate about our families. Um, what I would say is <clears throat> that I truly believe a community that reads together can grow together. I truly believe that with all my heart. Um, and I think that it's past time for the whole community, the whole community in our grocery stores, every event that we have, we have to lace it with literacy. Like somehow, some way, every time families come out to our Easter egg hunts, where there's music, where there's going to be a large population of people, the Juneteenth, we have to make literacy a priority. It can no longer be back in the corner. If it's a crisis, it has to be center stage because it truly will take a village to deal with this monster because it was crafted intentionally. Let's not forget that this monster years and years and years was crafted intentionally and it will take a village. But just remember, once we get on the same page, a community that reads together will grow and thrive together. Thank you so much. And for all of you, thank you so much. And for all of you, I am so honored that you, you agreed to be on this panel. And I'm so honored that, to have you as part of the Literacy Coalition. And thank you for the work that you do, because I know how much all of you care about our children and our family. So thank you. And everybody give them a big hand. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Eli, Loretta, members of the program committee. And thank all of you so much not just for uh, being here, although that's great considering all the time you, you know, you've donated to us, but thank you for all the work you do. It's, we're all very impressed. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, hey, have you noticed today's January 6th? I think every single one of us remembers exactly where we were and how we felt. And those images started coming across our screens. Horror, terror, outrage. We will not let that happen again. As uh, my friend Jennifer Fairfield and, and I are constantly saying, we are, you know, people constantly complain, the Democrats messaging, the Democrats messaging. We are all messengers. We are all Democratic messengers. So go out every conversation you have, just confirm that people understand what's at stake here. Are we going to give our democracy over to a mob or are we going to own our own lives? <laughs> every, every time. People, a lot of people don't quite get it. So you're a democratic messenger, get the message out. Um, there is a, the Ann, Ann, Ar, Ann Arbor Indivisible is having a commemoration of the January 6th um, events at one o'clock. So if you make it, if you hurry, you can <laughs> yeah. at the county courthouse at, um, what's it, what's, it's Huron and what? Huron. Huron and Maine. Okay. So be there. It'll be short, um, but it'll be, but it's important to, you know, stand there and say, we object we object and we are going to protect our democracy. Um, I probably have more to say, but I can't remember what it is, but the, except for this, the last thing, first of all, take a button, take any button, take one of the flyers, remember myvoter.org. So in private, all by yourself, you can find out who your reps are all the way down to precinct delegate, easy peasy, uh, myvoter.org. 
And finally, if you have not signed uh, Debbie Dingell's nominating petition, please do. They're out there on the table. I know one is almost full or is full. If that if you see one that's full, just put it under the stack and take, you know, and start a new one. Okay. Thank you all for being here, especially all you new people. We are so, so happy to welcome you here into our community. And we look forward to working with you this year. <laughs>